In the Money is made possible by financial support from Old National Bank and Chicagoans like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to In the Money. I am your host, Kimberly Loftus, a CPA and financial executive who today is financially secure. But I was not born that way. I come from a family who struggled financially most of their lives. My early years were a struggle too, but higher education was my road to financial freedom. This financial freedom is not totally free if you are the only one or one of a few who have made it out of poverty in the family. There is an obligation to help others. This can be stressful even if you have a giving heart. Any comeuppance is always looked at as much more than what it is when you come from abject poverty or lack of financial management know-how. For many of us who are the few who made it, we are not only responsible for our own well-being and family, but also the ones left behind. Every financial shortage or even want becomes your responsibility. This level of responsibility is not sustainable for those of you who are trying to help, nor sustainable for you too. It is time to set boundaries so everyone can come out ahead. But it took me an aha moment to realize this. I loaned a family member the money received from my first post-college employer to pay my corporate credit card. The corporate credit card bill was due with no payback of the loan, and I feared I would lose my job due to it. But at last minute, another family member came through and saved the day. My inability to say no to my family put my own future in jeopardy. In the living room today, we will learn how the lack of generational wealth impacts the individual financial burden and how to set boundaries so we can start passing money down to future generations instead of just getting by. You may be wondering, what in the world does financial boundaries have to do with creating generational wealth? Well, here to explain is Charlene Reinhardt, founder of Wealthy Woman Daily, author and contributing writer to such publications as Black Enterprise, to name one. Welcome to the show, Charlene. Can you elaborate how the lack of foundational boundaries impact the ability to pass down money to future generations? Hi, Kimberly. Thanks for having me. This is such an important question. One report states that if current trends continue, black wealth will fall to zero. Black median wealth will fall to zero by 2053. That means we need to take action now. Generational wealth will be eliminated. It won't be a possibility if we don't take actions now to ensure we are setting up financial boundaries with our loved ones. So can you give an example of ways that people are not setting financial boundaries, not even when we say loved ones, it could be even your kids getting a new pair of shoes all the way to your great, 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 great aunt asking for a loan. Can you explain a little bit more? That's correct. Let's start with the kids because we want to throw our financial power at them. We want to throw money at them so that they don't have to live the way we did, right? Mm -hmm. But we have to take caution when we go in that direction because you don't want your kids to think that everything just comes to them for free and that they can ask and mommy and daddy are the bank accounts, right? right? You want to start teaching your kids financial habits right now. One way you can do that is when you go to the store, mm -hmm. look at the prices. Talk to your kids about the value of the items associated with those prices and have them use their dollars that you may have given them for allowance to pay for some items. Have them make decisions because learning how to make better decisions is key to keeping and maintaining generational wealth. Okay, so now let's go through the ages as we talk about tips for each age group. So if I'm a preteen, what will be a suggestion to help them learn about the financial boundaries of money and give them a way to pass down generational wealth to the preteen? What would you suggest? Like you gave the grocery store example, any others? Yes, we'll give them jobs and that they can get paid for. Yeah, I think okay. that's beneficial. Show them the power of earning money because when they earn $100, they have to make decisions. They have to determine how they are going to allocate those funds. And if they run out of money, don't go in your bank account giving them additional mm -hmm. funds. Teach them that they need to learn how to use their money wisely so that they can have money now and later. 
Plus, I think this is a valuable time to teach them about the power of having accounts like a Roth IRA, right? If your child learns how to build a retirement account at a young age, those lessons will stay with them in their adulthood and beyond that, right? Mm -hmm. So teaching kids things like that so that they can understand financial responsibility at a young age, now you won't have to fund them for the rest of their lives. Okay. They're off your bank account. What about teenagers? So we talked about preteens. What would you do for teenagers? So they have a job. How can I further give them that lesson of financial freedom and boundaries? Yes, so they have a job. Now let's think about their next steps before they become adults. Mm -hmm. What is that next step for a lot of people? Going to college. Mm -hmm. Get them involved in the college planning process. Don't just tuck away your money mm -hmm. into an account. Make sure they are involved. So tell them, how can you fund your education as well? Through scholarships, internships. Have them think about a financial plan for their education because now they are invested in the process and they probably won't ditch classes either mm -hmm. because they know that their money, their time is invested into this process. So they value it more because they have some skin in the game versus mommy and daddy paying for everything. Exactly. I like that. I like that. Now, Young adults, so they, they moved away from home, but they're still struggling. How can the parents or family members help them set financial boundaries so they can have something for their future generation? Yes, young adults starting out. One of the first things that they wanna learn is, how do I allocate this big portion of money that I get from a job? Because I'm not just getting money, I get access to retirement accounts. Mm -hmm. I may even get access to equity benefits at work. So now you wanna teach your child how to make those decisions when they sign a job offer. Mm -hmm. Should we negotiate that offer, right? Does it make sense based on your skill set? How do you manage these accounts and perks that your job is giving you access to? Because now if they can be in the driver's seat mm -hmm. of that process, they won't have to rely on mommy and daddy for those big ticket items like buying a house later. They can start their foundation at work. How do they use the funds they have at work to support their lifestyle later? So now we went through some a preteen, a teenager, a young adult. Now let's flip it to the parents themselves, the adults themselves, who are being asked to break down these financial boundaries to help extended family members, immediate family members. What would be your recommendations for them to kind of deal with that? I think you have to sit down as a family and talk about this because generational wealth is a family affair. Mm -hmm. You cannot depend on one person if you want to create wealth for generations. So what that means is we are going to set a family meeting and we are going to talk about those things that each one of us can do to generate money so that we can be financially independent. What things do we need to do? Maybe giving up some of those expensive habits, mm -hmm. right? What things do we need to do in order to be independent and to be able to contribute to the family instead of taking away from the family's progress? I like that. So, but what about the extended family? I can see how that works with just, you know, the parents and the children, but what about, you know, the great aunt, the cousins? How do you, you know, set boundaries with, you know, the whole family, the extended family. Yes, well, if you have a business, you can always say, hey, you can have a job here if you want that additional money. <laughs> right. But seriously, if you have additional family members who want money, you want to have that conversation with them and ask them, what is it for? What are alternative ways you can pay for this? You want to get them to thinking about how they can finance the goals and maybe bills that they have. So give them homework. Okay. I think that's important. When you give people homework, instead of giving them money, mm -hmm. it requires them to think about how they plan to manage their finances and if they will ever ask you for money again because they know they'll have homework coming with that ask. So I like the educational component. I think that is a wonderful idea because you're educating family members about how to manage their money. So I, I love that idea. But what about I still want to help that family member out so I can combine the educational component with you know some financial help, but how do I set overall, like for example, say that I have $2,000 for the entire year 
for the extended family to use. Whoever comes first kind of gets it. How would I set parameters around that? That's a good question. I think as a family, you can probably think about, okay, what warrants access mm -hmm. to these funds, right? Is it you building a business? Are we going to allocate funds to help somebody in our family start a new business that can employ other people in our family? Mm -hmm. Are we going to help somebody get an education so that they can be in a better position to take care of their current family? What experiences or opportunities make sense for us to invest in because really we're talking about investments here what type of investments do we want to make into our family and so i think that's a family decision and you really have to think about that generational wealth plan where do you see your family in 10 20 30 40 years it requires us to have a long-term outlook in order to determine what decisions make sense right now so it could be that these uh, funds could be an investment fund for someone to get to the higher level, like through education or home ownership. But it also could be a fund for just, you know, people struggling. I can't pay my rent, but have clear guidelines of how you can access those funds, which kind of stop people from just calling you willy nilly and always having an emergency because you set a dollar amount and you said, this is how you access those funds. Exactly. Put expectations around the money. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that a lot. And then it's almost like your, you know, your family's your own investment firm yes. for itself. And then you kind of set those what you value. Um, That's the power because you can create your own family bank. Right. Now our family is operating as a business. Mm, I like that. Now we can create generational power and generational wealth through that business that everyone has a say in. So the key to generational wealth building is setting those boundaries, understanding what your goals are to invest in the family so that they can rise up and create that wealth is what I'm hearing. Exactly. Thank you so much for joining us today, Charlene. Thank you for having me. I'm Bianca Cotton, host of Behind the Confidence Smile. Tune in this Friday at 7 p.m. for Fortitude at the Death of a Spouse. That is one of the like biggest pain points when you know you have this child and you know that you like had this child with your husband mm -hmm. and now your husband is no longer here. Now joining us in the living room is Tamika Hill, a licensed clinical social worker and author. Tamika, we just discussed how not setting financial boundaries can impact future generations. However, telling someone no, especially a loved one, is hard to do. Do you have any suggestions on how to handle this with our families? Yes, um, learning to say no and feel the guilt, because that's what most people don't want to do. They don't want to feel guilty or mm -hmm. be the villain. And I've taught people, you have to normalize being the villain, because if you're not the villain sometimes, that means you're going to overwork you. Mm -hmm. Um, so you got to learn to be okay with that. You're going to be the villain, but you're also teaching them how to be their own resource. But what if I just have it like that? Isn't that wrong? No Shouldn't I feel guilty that I'm not sharing? No such thing as you have it all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you also don't want to enable others to not get their own because just because you have it, you don't want to teach them to not have it by relying on you. Mm -hmm. Because believe it or not, when we give, 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 we're teaching people or enabling them to walk their own journey to learn how to make money, save money, build their credit, because they're not learning anything if we're giving. But what about, well, I guess we all have those family members who kind of going to go off because you told them no. Like, how do I handle that in the moment? You have to be okay with people feel their feelings. Mm -hmm. Embrace that they, they're going to have their feelings. You don't have to have their feelings with them. Mm -hmm. You can respect that they have their feelings and be okay that you're the villain in that moment, rightfully so, and walk away. Now, Charlene, our er earlier guest, mentioned some examples of how we could teach family members about money, like an investment fund. What do you think about those type of ideas to build generational wealth around also telling someone no because you're trying to build generational wealth? Oh, I love that. That's mm -hmm. perfect because that also gives them a solution with your boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's beneficial. Some people will take to it and some people won't and that's okay. But again, I think teaching them along with implementing boundaries discourage enabling. 
Hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit more about discouraging and enabling? Well, because when you give, we also enable, believe it or not, right? Because hmm. I know we're taught giving is the right thing to do. Right. Um, however, if you think about it, if you're constantly giving to people who are in the crunch, that must mean they have bad money habits. Oh, okay. So if you think about it, you're only enabling their problem. You're not helping. So they're never getting out of the issue. It keeps reoccurring because you're enabling by keeping to help them. Yes. And money can just buy any other vice that people have. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So can you give any tips on how do I have that conversation, even if, you know, to tell somebody no in a, you know, productive way, not an accusatory way or, or a way that I'm putting someone down? Yes, I believe firm no's matter, mm -hmm. um, not disrespectful no's, and not out of uh, an emotional no. Just no, I can't do that right now. However, as the previous guest suggested, hey, how about I teach you though, or give you some guidelines about how to build financial wealth, or can I give you some suggestions if you're open? Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, and in the moment though, again, they're gonna probably be angry and we just have to figure out a way to kind of deal with that because that is their issue, not your issue, correct? Yes. That's a way to look at it? Yes, we have to learn to be okay with people, especially when you're the villain in somebody's story. Mm -hmm. Most of the time we're not taught to be okay with being the villain, but it's their feelings. So what about your immediate family, like your kids, like you're telling your kids no? Mm -hmm. That's also very difficult. So mm -hmm. I know how I grew up, so I want to give my daughter the world, mm -hmm. but am I giving her good money habits if I'm doing that, like you mentioned? So how are things that I can mentally check myself to make sure that I'm not creating a monster? <laughs> um, the best thing you could do is teach your kid how to live without you, mm. because one day you're gonna depart the earth. And the worst thing you could do is have them codependent on you and they don't know how to manage without you. I like that. Can you give me some examples of how I could do that going back to early ages to young adults who may be still living at home? Well, I think early on um, you have to start teaching them responsibility mm -hmm. um, with money um, and letting them feel the consequences of their choices with their money early on versus um, getting in there and being the buffer. Because mm -hmm. sometimes when we don't understand the consequences, we repeat the behaviors. So okay. for parents, I think you have to start early and if they want a bag of chips, right? They get an allowance, they blow their money on all the snacks. You don't get anything else. That's the consequence. Right, just making sure that they understand the consequences of their actions and then they'll do better the next time they get their next allowance. Yes. Because they, you didn't swoop in and save the day. Yes. And then setting financial boundaries for yourself. Mm -hmm. So for, you know, you have your money, you might overspend on shoes or clothes or whatever. How do I set foundation boundaries or check myself to make sure that I'm leaving something for my um, kids? Making sure you're not emotionally spending. Mm -hmm. Like, because uh, a lot of times we're emotionally reactive, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and so allowing yourself a budget, though, to spend but not going past that budget helps, but also checking why am I buying this? Okay. What emotion am I feeling? Because a lot of times it's hard to tell your own self no, because you're like, hey, I'm working, I'm doing this, I can do this for myself, but then you're forgetting that if I bought my daughter that $500 pair of shoes, mm -hmm. that's something that could have went to her college education fund. That's true. But I think we gotta have balance. Yeah, you gotta have balance. Yeah. So it's okay to spend a little, like you said, but it's part of your budget. It's not just willy-nilly. Yes. I think always making sure you're balancing your emotions and your money and they're on the same playing level. So what is a plan for me to learn how to balance my emotions? So I hear these are good habits to create, but I have no idea, how do I do that? Well, for a person, one, um, if just say for instance, you're not into therapy, mm -hmm. um, I would suggest start journaling around when you feel an emotion or urge to spend. Mm -hmm. So you can start to see your own patterns. Mm -hmm. Like, what are your triggers that make you want to spend? And then what are some examples or suggestions? You know, I don't take uh, negativity well, and I internalize that. Mm -hmm. People like that, when you're telling somebody, no, you don't want to disappoint. Like, how do I get on a journey without therapy to be a better no person? You have to first figure out why you um, aren't comfortable saying no, right? Mm -hmm. um, so... One of the things I always suggest um, is the seven layers of why. Mm -hmm. um, 
why is this bothering me? And it cannot end in that person. So it has to end with you figuring out what's behind that that's going on with you. Hmm, interesting. Mm -hmm. So I could, so it could be it's not bothering. It's bothering me because it's my uh, brother. Mm -hmm. But it can't be the answer because it has to be something internal to me yes. that, you know, I don't want to disappoint my brother. And then I had to dig deeper to say, why don't I want to disappoint my brother? Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what you're talking about? You yes. said there are seven. What, what are some of the other ones? So you have to keep asking why till it ends up to you. Because oh. we're very superficial, right? We'll mm -hmm. say, no, it's because of my brother. Mm -hmm. Okay, why? I don't want my brother to be mad. Why don't you want your brother to be mad? I don't like it when people mad at me. Why you don't like it when people mad at you? So it makes you dig deeper mm -hmm. into your root why. Interesting. And do you journal that or do you work through a therapist with that? Or how does that you work? You do both. Okay. It, like I said, if you're not into therapy, that's just one quick solution um, that goes over more mentally, internally, mm -hmm. I guess, when you're in the moment. But you also can journal it later. Now, in your practice, you find a lot of times people with financial issues or also having problems telling people no or themselves no? Yes, no is a hard word. We don't mm -hmm. like boundaries. Right. <laughs> we don't like boundaries for other people or us. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So it's really just recognizing that setting boundaries is healthy. Yes. You set boundaries for other things. Why shouldn't money be any different? Yes. And then just the power of no and being okay with saying no. Yes. There's something I myself I have to actually deal with of just being able to say no and being comfortable with it and not be the villain. Yes. You can be the villain, though. Mm. So be okay with being the villain because if you're not the villain, sometimes that means your cup will overfill with trying to make everybody else happy. Okay. And then that means you're not happy because you can't make everybody happy. Uh, we live in a society that hasn't taught us it's okay to be the villain sometimes. Now, Tamika, I am a financial person. I know when I overspend that I can't give to anyone else and that I need to correct myself. But if I have more money than I spent and I want to give that to someone to help them out, how do I know I'm doing the right thing? Even though I've met my own goals, how do I know when to say yes? I think you also have to take in a person's uh, how they are right mm -hmm. into account. Am I enabling them mm -hmm. or am I really helping them? Mm -hmm. Um, that's how I personally evaluate things. Like, is this further enabling a bad money habit that they have or credit habit? Or is this just somebody who's in a pinch um, who needs help? So could an example be, hey, I temporarily lost my job and I need help paying my rent because it's been six months versus someone who's always chronically never paying their rent or never keeping a job. Mm -hmm. That would be an example of enabling versus actually helping. Yes. Okay. And then I think also, too, um, is it teaching them how to help build generational wealth, too, right? Mm -hmm. Because even though, yes, I have it, but if I'm giving in abundance, is that leaving enough for the next generation after me? But it's so hard because a lot of us have been raised to say, if you have it, help. Mm -hmm. And then, but we're also saying, yeah, we want to help you, but there's kind of strings attached because you have to educate them about money. How do you get over that? you know, feeling of tying money to some type of outcome? I think we got to re-educate the word help mm. because if I'm enabling you, am I helping you? Good point. Many thanks to Tamika for sharing such raw and real advice. Now, before we get to my closing thoughts, here's a brief word from our friends at Old National Bank. Take it away, Ben. <laughs> Now we're going to talk about why to work with a bank or credit union as opposed to looking at other alternatives like payday lending, check cashing, and so forth. So when you're looking at what bank is right for you, I encourage you to look at multiple and find the place that's best for you. Look at their account structure. What are the fees? Do they have competitive interest rates? What type of accounts do they offer? Are there online and mobile features that are important to you? And what's their ATM network look like? Most people wonder why an ATM network matters, but if you think about it, if you're somebody that travels a lot, would it be beneficial for you to have more access to ATMs without having to pay a fee to access that money? If you think about cost, the average person that does not use a financial institution is paying a fee to do their banking. What do I mean by that? For those that rely on check cashing services and so forth, they're going to pay a fee every single time they cash their paycheck. 
they're also going to have to pay their bills. And without a bank account, they're most likely going to rely on money orders. There is a fee to use those as well. So what does this all mean? Well, when you look at the average cost for somebody that is not using a financial institution, on a yearly basis, they're going to spend around $1,000 on average just to do their banking. Also, digital technology is very important. The things that banks are able to offer now to clients for utilizing mobile and online banking is great. You think about it, what might you need to see a bank for down the road? Could be a loan, could be for a house, a car, investments, whatever it may be. And the better that your bank knows you, the more that we can do for you. So I think it's really important to set a relationship with whatever bank you work with and let them know your goals. And as you build that relationship with the bank, when the time comes that you do need to borrow money for a house or see a financial advisor or whatever it may be, they've already established that relationship so they can hopefully do more for you at that point. I'm Corey Timms, host of the In My Own Words podcast. Tune in this Friday at 7.30 p.m. on Channel 19, featuring my special guest, Chicago City Clerk, Anna Valencia. Trump was coming into office. And there was a wave of women that were mad as hell and were going to step up into leadership positions. And Riyadh said, you push women all the time. You're pushing them to lead and mm -hmm. you need to do it yourself. Today, we talked about wealth building, which is done over time, generation by generation, and not overnight. This requires us to be purposeful in our spending and giving habits. Purposeful giving sets limits and allows you to have something left for your kids and your grandkids, which hopefully the positive money cycle will continue. We also learned about setting healthy financial boundaries. These boundaries mean being realistic about how much you can share without harming yourself, as well as helping solve your loved one's root cause of the money emergency that occurred in the first place. My money challenge to you is to have the money talk with those family members who seem to always need financial help and set limits. Also, make sure to understand your own giving triggers that put your own well-being at risk to prevent it from happening in the future. Remember, your money journey should be progressing to a place of joy, not burden. You do not have to justify your no to anyone. And as always, I tell my daughter, the only person that should be counting my money is me. Thank you.